Section 2 of A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud Translated by Granville Stanley Hall This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ashley Jane Section 2 Second Lecture The Psychology of Errors we begin with an investigation, not with hypothesis. To this end, we choose the certain phenomena which are very frequent, very familiar and very little heeded and which have nothing to do with the pathological inasmuch as they can be observed in every normal person. I refer to the errors which an individual commits as for example errors of speech in which he wishes to say something and uses the wrong word or those which happen to him in writing and which he may or may not notice or the case of misreading in which one reads in the print or writing something different from what is actually there a similar phenomenon occurs in these cases of mishearing what is said to one where there is no question of an organic disturbance of the auditory function. Another series of such occurrences is based on forgetfulness, but on a forgetfulness which is not permanent but temporary, as for instance when one cannot think of a name which one knows and always recognises or when one forgets to carry out a project at the proper time but which one remembers again later and therefore has only forgotten for a certain interval in a third class this characteristic of transience is lacking as for example in mislaying things so that they cannot be found again or in the analogous case of losing things here we are dealing with a kind of forgetfulness to which one reacts differently from the other cases a forgetfulness at which one is surprised and annoyed instead of considering it comprehensible allied with these phenomena is that of erroneous ideas in which the element of transience is again prominent inasmuch as for a while one believes something which before and after that time one knows to be untrue and a number of similar phenomena of different designations these are all occurrences whose inner connection is expressed in the use of the same prefix of designation. They are almost all unimportant, generally temporary and without much significance in the life of the individual. It is only rarely that one of them, such as the phenomenon of losing things, attains to a certain practical importance. For that reason also they do not attract much attention they arouse only weak effects. It is, therefore, to these phenomena that I would now direct your attention. But you will object with annoyance. There are so many sublime riddles in the external world just as there are in the narrower world of the psychic life and so many wonders in the field of psychic disturbances which demand and deserve elucidation that it really seems frivolous to waste labour and interest on such trifles if you can explain to us how an individual with sound eyes and ears can in broad daylight see and hear things that do not exist or why another individual suddenly believes himself persecuted by those whom up to that time he loved best or defend with the most ingenious arguments delusions which must seem nonsense to any child then we will be willing to consider psychoanalysis seriously but if psychoanalysis can do nothing better than to occupy us with the question of why a speaker used the wrong word or why a housekeeper mislaid her keys or such trifles then we know something better to do with our time and interest my answer is patience ladies and gentlemen i think your criticism is not on the right track it is true that psychoanalysis cannot boast that it has never occupied itself with trifles on the contrary the objects of its observations are generally those simple occurrences which the other sciences have thrown aside as much too insignificant the waste products of the phenomenal world but are you not confounding in your criticism the sublimity of the problems with the conspicuousness of their manifestations 
are there not very important things which under certain circumstances and at certain times can betray themselves only by very faint signs i could easily cite a great many instances of this kind from what vague signs for instance do the young gentlemen of this audience conclude that they have won the favour of a lady do you await an explicit declaration an ardent embrace or does not a glance scarcely perceptible to others a fleeting gesture a prolonging of a handshake by one second suffice and if you are a criminal lawyer and engaged in the investigation of a murder do you actually expect the murderer to leave his photograph and address on the scene of the crime or would you of necessity content yourself with fainter and less certain traces of that individual therefore let us not undervalue small signs perhaps by means of them we will succeed in getting on the track of greater things i agree with you that the larger problems of the world and of science have the first claim on our interest but it is generally of little avail to form the definite resolution to devote oneself to the investigation of this or that problem often one does not know in which direction to take the next step in scientific research it is more fruitful to attempt what happens to be before one at the moment and for whose investigation there is a discoverable method if one does that thoroughly without prejudice or predisposition one may with good fortune and by virtue of the connection which links each thing to every other hence also the small to the great discover even from such modest research a point of approach to study of the big problems thus would i answer in order to secure your attention for the consideration of these apparently insignificant errors made by normal people at this point we will question a stranger to psychoanalysis and ask him how he explains these occurrences his first answer is sure to be oh they are not worth an explanation they are merely slight accidents what does he mean by this does he mean to assert that there are any occurrences so insignificant that they fall out of the causal sequence of things or that they might just as well be something different from what they are if any one thus denies the determination of natural phenomena at one such point he has vitiated the entire scientific viewpoint one can then point out to him how much more consistent is the religious point of view when it explicitly asserts that no sparrow falls from the roof without god's special wish i imagine our friends will not be willing to follow his first answer to its logical conclusion he will interrupt and say that if he were to study these things he will probably find an explanation for them he will say that this is a case of slight functual disturbance of an inaccurate psychic act whose causal factors can be outlined a man who otherwise speaks correctly may make a slip of the tongue when he is slightly ill or fatigued when he is excited when his attention is concentrated on something else it is easy to prove these statements slips of the tongue do really occur with special frequency when one is tired when one has a headache or when one is indisposed forgetting proper names is a very frequent occurrence under these circumstances many persons even recognize the imminence of an indisposition by the ability to recall proper names often also one mixes up words or objects during excitement one picks up the wrong things and the forgetting of projects as well as the doing of any number of other unintentional acts becomes conspicuous when one is distracted in other words when one's attention is concentrated on other things a familiar instance of such distraction is the professor in fliegende blatter which takes the wrong hat because he is thinking of the problems which he wishes to treat in his next book each of us knows from experience some examples of how one can forget projects which one has planned and promises which one has made because an experience has intervened which has preoccupied one deeply this seems both comprehensible and irrefutable it is perhaps not very interesting not as we expected it to be but let us consider this explanation of errors the conditions which have been cited as necessary for the occurrence of these phenomena are not all identical illness and disorders of circulation afford a physiological basis 
excitement, fatigue and distraction are conditions of a different thought, which one could designate as psychophysiological. About these latter it is easy to theorise. Fatigue as well as distraction, and perhaps also general excitement, cause a scattering of the attention which can result in the act in progress not receiving sufficient attention. This act can then be more easily interrupted than usual and may be inexactly carried out. A slight illness or a change in the distribution of blood in the central organ of the nervous system can have the same effect inasmuch as its influences the determining factor, the distribution of attention, in a similar way. In all cases, therefore, it is a question of the effects of a distraction of the attention caused either by organic or psychic factors. But this does not seem to yield much of interest for our psychoanalytic investigation. We might even feel tempted to give up the subject. To be sure, when we look more closely, we find that not everything squares with this attention theory of psychological errors or that at any rate not everything can be directly deduced from it. We find that such errors and such forgetting occur even when people are not fatigued, distracted or excited, but are in every way in their normal state, unless in consequence of these errors one were to attribute them to an excitement which they themselves do not acknowledge. Nor is the mechanism so simple that the success of an act is assured by an intensification of the attention bestowed upon it and endangered by its diminution. There are many acts which one performs in a purely automatic way and with very little attention but which are yet carried out quite successfully. The pedestrian who scarcely knows where he is going nevertheless keeps to the right road and stops at his destination without having gone astray. At least this is the rule. The practised pianist touches the right keys without thinking of them. He may, of course, also make an occasional mistake, but if automatic playing increased the likelihood of errors, it would be just the virtuoso whose playing has, through practice, become most automatic who would be the most exposed to this danger. Yet we see, on the contrary, that many acts are most successfully carried out when they are not the objects of particularly concentrated attention, and that the mistakes occur just at the point where one is most anxious to be accurate where a distraction of the necessary attention is therefore surely least permissible. One could then say that this is the effect of the excitement, but we do not understand why the excitement does not intensify the concentration of attention on the goal that is so much desired. If in an important speech or discussion anyone says the opposite of what he means, then that can hardly be explained according to the psychophysiological or the attention theories. There are also many other small phenomena accompanying these errors, which are not understood and which have not been rendered comprehensible to us by these explanations. For instance, when one has temporarily forgotten a name, one is annoyed, one is determined to recall it and is unable to give up the attempt. Why is it that despite his annoyance, the individual cannot succeed as he wishes in directing his attention to the word which is on the tip of his tongue and which he instantly recognises when it is pronounced to him? Or, to take another example, there are cases in which the errors multiply, link themselves together, substitute for each other. The first time one forgets an appointment, the next time, after having made a special resolution not to forget it, one discovers that one has made a mistake in the day or hour. Or one tries by devious means to remember a forgotten word and in the course of so doing loses track of a second name which would have been of use in finding the first. If one then pursues this second name, a third gets lost and so on. It is notorious that the same thing can happen in the case of misprints, which are, of course, to be considered as errors of the typesetter. A stubborn error of this sort is said to have crept into a social democratic paper where, in the account of a certain festivity, was printed. Among those present was His Highness, the Clown Prince. 
The next day a correction was attempted. The paper apologised and said the sentence should of course have read the clown prince. One likes to attribute these occurrences to the printer's devil, to the goblin of the typesetting machine and the like, figurative expressions which at least go beyond a psychophysiological theory of the misprint. I do not know if you are acquainted with the fact that one can provoke slips of the tongue, can call them forth by suggestion, as it were. An anecdote will serve to illustrate this. Once, when a novice on the stage was entrusted with the important role in The Maid of Orleans of announcing to the king Connetable sheaths his sword, the star played the joke of repeating to the frightened beginner during the rehearsal instead of the text the following comfortable sends back his steed and he attained his end in the performance the unfortunate actor actually made his debut with this distorted announcement even after he had been amply warned against so doing or perhaps just for that reason these little characteristics of errors are not exactly illuminated by the theory of diverted attention but that does not necessarily prove the whole theory wrong. There is perhaps something missing, a complement by the addition of which the theory would be made completely satisfactory. But many of the errors themselves can be regarded from another aspect. Let us select slips of the tongue as best suited to our purpose. We might equally well choose slips of the pen or of reading. But at this point we must make clear to ourselves the fact that so far we have inquired only as to when and under what conditions one's tongue slips, and have received an answer on this point only. One can, however, direct one's interest elsewhere and ask why one makes just this particular slip and no other. One can consider what the slip results in. You must realise that as long as one does not answer this question, does not explain the effect produced by the slip. The phenomenon in its psychological aspect remains an accident, even if its physiological explanation has been found. When it happens that I commit a slip of the tongue, I could obviously make any one of an infinite number of slips, and in place of the one right word, say any one of a thousand others, make innumerable distortions of the right word, now, is there anything which forces upon me in a specific instance just this one special slip out of all those which are possible, or does that remain accidental and arbitrary, and can nothing rational be found in answer to this question? Two authors, Moringa and Mayer, a philologist and a psychiatrist, did indeed in 1895 make the attempt to approach the problem of slips of the tongue from this side. They collected examples and first treated them from a purely descriptive standpoint. That, of course, does not yet furnish any explanation, but may open the way to one. They differentiated the distortions which the intended phrase suffered through the slip into interchanges of positions of words, interchanges of parts of words, perservations, compoundings and substitutions. I will give you examples of these authors' main categories. It is a case of the interchange of the first sort if someone says the Milo of Venus instead of the Venus of Milo. An example of the second type of interchange. I had a blush of rud to the head instead of rush of blood. A perservation would be the familiar misplaced toast. I ask you to join me in hiccuffing the health of our chief. These three forms of slips are not very frequent. You will find those cases much more frequent in which the slip results from a drawing together or compounding of syllables. For example, a gentleman on the street addresses a lady with the words, If you will allow me, madam, I should be very glad to escort you. In the compounded word, there is obviously, besides the word escort, also the word insult. And parenthetically, we may remark that the young man will not find much favour with the lady. As an example of the substitution, Moringa and Mayer cite the following. A man says, I put the specimens in the letter box instead of in the hotbed, 
and the like. The explanation which the two authors attempt to formulate on the basis of this collection of examples is peculiarly inadequate. They hold that the sounds and syllables of words have different values, and that the production and perception of more highly valued syllables can interfere with those of lower values. They obviously base this conclusion on the cases of foresounding and perservation, which are not at all frequent. In other cases of slips of the tongue, the question of such sound priorities, if any exist, does not enter at all. The most frequent cases of slips of the tongue are those in which instead of a certain word one says another which resembles it, and one may consider this resemblance sufficient explanation. For example, a professor says in his initial lecture, I am not inclined to evaluate the merits of my predecessor. Or another professor says, in the case of the female genital, despite many temptations, I mean many attempts etc. The most common and also the most conspicuous form of slips of the tongue, however, is that of saying the exact opposite of what one means to say. In such cases one goes far afield from the problem of sound relations and resemblance effects and can cite, instead of these, the fact that opposites have an obviously close relationship to each other and have particularly close relations in the psychology of association. There are historical examples of this sort. A president of our House of Representatives once opened the assembly with the words, Gentlemen, I declare a quorum present, and herewith declare the assembly closed. Similar in its trickiness to the relation of opposites is the effect of any other facile association which may under certain circumstances arise most inopportunely. Thus, for instance, there is the story which relates that on the occasion of a festivity in honour of the marriage of a child of H. Helmholtz with a child of the well-known discoverer and captain of industry, W. Simon, the famous physiologist Dubois Raymond, was asked to speak. He concluded his undoubtedly sparkling toast with the words, Success to the new firm, Simons and Halsky. That, of course, was the name of the well-known old firm. The association of the two names must have been about as easy for a native of Berlin as Weber and Fields to an American. Thus, we must add to the sound relations and word resemblances the influence of word associations. But that is not all. In a series of cases, an explanation of the observed slip is unsuccessful unless we take into account what phrase had been said or even thought previously. This again makes it a case of perservation, of the sort stressed by Moringa, but of a longer duration. I must admit I am on the whole of the impression that we are further than ever from an explanation of slips of the tongue. However, I hope I am not wrong when I say that during the above investigation of these examples of slips of the tongue, we have all obtained a new impression on which it will be of value to dwell. We sought the general conditions under which slips of the tongue occur, and then the influences which determine the kind of distortion resulting from the slip. But we have in no way yet considered the effect of the slip on the tongue in itself without regard to its origin. And if we should decide to do so, we must finally have the courage to assert. In some of the examples cited, the product of the slip also makes sense. What do we mean by it makes sense? It means, I think, that the product of the slip has itself a right to be considered as a valid psychic act, which also has its purpose as a manifestation having content and meaning. Hitherto we have always spoken of errors, but now it seems as if sometimes the error itself will quite a normal act, except that it has thrust itself into the place of some other expected or intended act. In isolated cases, this valid meaning seems obvious and unmistakable. When the President, with his opening words, closes the session of the House of Representatives, instead of opening it, we are inclined to consider this error meaningful by reason of our knowledge of the circumstances under which the slip occurred. 
He expects no good of the assembly, and would be glad if he could terminate it immediately. The pointing out of this meaning, the interpretation of this error, gives us no difficulty. Or a lady pretending to admire says to another, I am sure you must have messed up this charming hat yourself. No scientific quibbles in the world can keep us from discovering in this slip the idea, this hat is a mess. Or a lady who is known for her energetic disposition relates, My husband asked the doctor to what diet he should keep. But the doctor said he didn't need any diet, he should eat and drink whatever I want. This slip of tongue is quite an unmistakable expression of a consistent purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, if it should turn out that not only a few cases of slips of the tongue and of errors in general, but the larger part of them have a meaning, then this meaning of errors, of which we have hitherto made no mention, will unavoidably become the greatest interest to us and will, with justice, force all other points of view into the background. We could then ignore all physiological and psychophysiological conditions and devote ourselves to the purely psychological investigations of the sense, that is, the meaning, the purpose of these errors. To this end, therefore, we will not fail shortly to study a more extensive compilation of material. But before we undertake this task, I should like to invite you to follow another line of thought with me. It has repeatedly happened that a poet has made use of slips of the tongue or some other error as a means of poetic presentation. This fact in itself must prove to us that he considers the error, the slip of the tongue for instance, as meaningful. For he creates it on purpose, and it is not a case of the poet committing an accidental slip of the pen and then letting his pen slip stand as the tongue slip of his character. He wants to make something clear to us by this slip of the tongue, and we may examine what it is, whether he wishes to indicate by this that the person in question is distracted or fatigued. Of course, we do not wish to exaggerate the importance of the fact that the poet did make use of a slip to express his meaning. It could nevertheless really be a psychic accident, or meaningful only in very rare cases, and the poet would still retain the right to infuse it with meaning through his setting. As for their poetic use, however, it would not be surprising if we should glean more information concerning slips of the tongue from the poet than from the theologist or the psychiatrist. Such an example of a slip of the tongue occurs in Wallenstein, Piccolomini, Act 1, Scene 5. In the previous scene, Max Piccolomini had most passionately sided with the Herzog and dilated ardently on the blessings of peace which disclosed themselves to him during the trip on which he accompanied Wallenstein's daughter to the camp. He leaves his father and the courtier, Questenberg, plunged in deepest consternation. And then the fifth scene continues. Questenberg. Alas, alas, and stands it so, what friend, and do we let him go away in this delusion? Let him go away, not call him back immediately, not open his eyes upon this spot. Octavio, recovering himself out of a deep study, he has now opened mine, and I see more than pleases me. Questenberg, what is it? Octavio, a curse on this journey. Questenberg. But why so? What is it? Octavio, come, come along, friend. I must follow up the ominous track immediately. Mine eyes are opened now, and I must use them. Come, draws Questenberg on with him. Questenberg, what now? Where go you then? Octavio, hastily, to her herself. Questenberg, to Octavio, interrupting him and correcting himself. To the duke, come on, let's go. Octavio meant to say, to him, to the lord. But his tongue slips, and through his words, to her, he betrays to us at least the fact that he had quite clearly recognised the influence which makes the young war hero dream of peace. A still more impressive example was found by O. Rank in Shakespeare. It occurs in The Merchant of Venice, in the famous scene in which the fortunate suitor makes his choice among the three caskets. 
and perhaps I can do no better than to read to you here Rank's short account of the incident. A slip of the tongue which occurs in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Act Three, Scene Two, is exceedingly delicate in its poetic motivation and technically brilliant in its handling. Like the slip of Wallenstein, quoted by Freud, Psychopathology of Everyday Life, Second Edition, page 48, it shows that the poets well know the meaning of these errors and assume their comprehensibility to the audience. Portia, who by her father's wish has been bound to the choice of a husband by lot, has so far escaped all her unfavoured suitors through the fortunes of chance. Since she has finally found in Bassanio the suitor to whom she is attached, she fears that he, too, will choose the wrong casket. She would like to tell him that even in that event he may rest assured of her love, but is prevented from so doing by her oath. In this inner conflict, the poet makes her say to the welcome suitor, I pray you tarry, pause a day or two before you hazard, for in choosing wrong I lose your company. Therefore forbear a while, there's something tells me, but it is not love, I would not lose you, I could teach you how to choose right, but then I am forsworn, so will I never be, so may you miss me, but if you do, you'll make me wish a sin that I had been forsworn, be shrew your eyes, they have overlooked me and divided me, one half of me is yours, the other half yours. Mine own, I would say, but if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Just that, therefore, which she meant merely to indicate faintly to him, or really to conceal from him entirely, namely that even before the choice of the lot, she was his and loved him. This the poet, with admirable psychological delicacy of feeling, makes apparent by her slip and is able by this artistic device to quiet the unbearable uncertainty of the lover as well as the equal suspense of the audience as to the issue of the choice. Notice at the end how subtly Portia reconciles the two declarations which are contained in the slip, how she resolves the contradiction between them and finally still manages to keep her promise. But if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Another thinker, alien to the field of medicine, accidentally disclosed the meaning of errors by an observation which has anticipated our attempts at explanation. You all know the clever satires of Lichtenberg, 1742-1749, to of which Goeth said, Where he jokes, there lurks a problem concealed. Not infrequently, the joke also brings to light the solution of the problem. Lichtenberg mentions in his jokes and satiric comments the remark that he always read Agamemnon for Angenomen. So intently had he read Homer. Herein is really contained the whole theory of misreadings. At the next session, we will see whether we can agree with the poets in their conception of the meaning of psychological errors. End of section two.